Good evening and welcome everyone to our webinar tonight entitled National Infrastructure Bank to the Rescue, Reversing the Ever-Deepening U.S. Infrastructure Crisis. If, if you all looked at the news this morning, you might have seen that we have massive wildfires in New Mexico and California and a massive heat dome moving into the Northeast. Already this year, we've had severe flooding in Florida and tornadoes in mid-America. Insurers are pulling out of some of these vulnerable places like Florida and California, wreaking havoc for homeowners that carry mortgages and need mortgage insurance. Um, in the midst of all of this, we need to address our failing infrastructure as a country, and we're here to discuss that tonight in how a national infrastructure bank can help us address some of the crisis being called, being created by climate change. We have a great lineup of speakers for you tonight. My name is Julie Olson. I'll be your moderator this evening. I'm a business owner and in Alaska and the chair of the Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats. I'd like to get right to our speakers tonight and um, we'll be working our way through um, this, this list, giving everyone an opportunity to comment. Please, if you have questions or comments, write them down and save them. We will have a Q&A period at the end. So with that, why don't we go right to our first speaker? We have with us Alfeka Mutardi. She's a former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund and is now the chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Alfeka, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome to all of you uh, folks out there who have been on our Zoom calls before and also uh, any newcomers. Um, I'd like to start out this evening's presentation by talking about where we are on the economy and uh, paying for infrastructure and how this infrastructure bank is probably our only avenue to solving all of our special uh, problems with the economy and uh, you know workers pay. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, the economy overall is slowing. Uh, GDP growth in the first quarter of 2004 slowed to 1.3% compared to 3.6% the quarter before. Unemployment is still low, but it's rising in some states. Housing prices are much higher than wages, as I'll show you in a minute, which is burdening a, a large segment of the population. And we have huge income inequality. 65% of Americans said that inflation has made their finances worse, especially on account of rising uh, cost of uh, housing. The Fed, meanwhile, uh, has decided with uh, in its last meeting this month, just a couple of weeks ago, to keep short-term interest rates unchanged at a high of 5.5%. What that means is we're going to have higher for longer interest rates that affects everything from your credit card interest to housing mortgages, uh, you know, prime rates for businesses. Uh, it really hurts corporations, real estate, refinancing of debt, all of that stuff gets really hurt and that will also slow the economy even more. Meanwhile, the federal budget is in crisis. Uh, the C the C Congressional Budget Office just announced yesterday that the deficit for 2024 uh, will be 1.9 billion. That's up uh, 0.2 billion higher than originally forecast. Meanwhile, interest on the debt is now higher than defense spending. And uh, the GOP controlled house has announced that it wants to slash spending uh, down to, 2000, uh, uh, to 2019 levels. And that's, that's because their aim is to lower taxes for the well-off of the corporations even further. And state budgets are also in crisis. Therefore, there is zero chance of adding more infrastructure spending through budgets uh, and the National Infrastructure Bank is the only avenue to cover these, um, these um, our, our infrastructure needs. Uh, so, but the big news is that despite uh, the spending that has been going on in the federal budget, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and CHIPS Act and IRA and those kind of things, the uh, financing gap for infrastructure is escalating. I'll show you that in more detail in just a minute. So the notion that we're going to ask the federal government to cover more of the infrastructure financing gap just isn't going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And the NIB is the only proven solution. 
How does it solve problems? It grows the economy faster. It solves income inequality by paying workers, the blue collar workers who are doing all of this uh, construction of new infrastructure and building the inputs for the uh, for the infrastructure. Uh, it pays them more. Uh, they'll have better uh, uh, wages coming out of that. It builds affordable housing. So that'll bring the prices of affordable housing down. And it solves fundamentally the federal budget crisis because we grow our way out of the budget crisis. Those are all the ways that only the National Infrastructure Bank can come to the rescue for our uh, economy in crisis. In addition to that, there are, let me see, try to hit this there. Uh, there are two sectors of the economy that are in such crisis that the, <laughs> the solutions cannot wait. We need the bank now to, to work on this. The first is the housing crisis. Home prices are up 54% since 2019. Rents are up 50 to 90%, depending on what city you live in. Wall Street banks have a big, huge war chest of money that they're going out and making cash offers for existing homes. And what is that doing? It is popping up home prices exponentially. You can see it on this graph right here. Here are housing prices. There was a bubble in 2000, before 2008 financial crisis. And now there's another bubble with these Wall Street banks buying, buying housing. Uh, and, and people's wages cannot keep up. These are, these are the median wages right down here. You can see this big gap widening on, on wages not being able to cover housing. So again, the infrastructure bank helps in two ways. It has $722 billion to build affordable housing targeted the, at the very lowest income earners. And uh, the, overall, the construction and the secondary inputs will create 25 million new high wage jobs. So that will lower housing costs and raise wages. And that solves the problem in the housing sector. The second sector that is really uh, cooking, <laughs> literally, is the power grid, the problems with the power grid. Uh, the grid is vulnerable to extreme weather events. What we know, and Julia has just mentioned, is we're, go we're going to be going uh, to into a really hot summer and all everybody's air conditioning is going to be going on and we're going to have brownouts. We could have more fires that uh, are caused by heat and, and uh, grass fires and, and you know, uh, wildfires like the one that burned down the the. Uh, lots of infrastructure in Hawaii, uh, California, Texas, New Mexico have all been also hit with um, devastating wildfires. We, the grid is not um, uh, does not have enough capacity to meet growing demand, which is projected to grow by 10 percent through uh, through 2032. Uh, there's not enough uh, grid capacity to take on all of the renewables that are lined up and waiting to come onto the grid. We have a um, um, a backlog of of, of um, thirty six. Uh, um, gee, where's is not on my slide here? Uh, we have a backlog of um, congestion that's prevent uh, of congestion of. 1,500 gigawatts that's pre preventing these renewables from coming onto the grid and even more if you uh, con um, problems with the grid uh, for demand. So uh, what we really need is, uh, and the summer heat, at this is, we've had one record summer, 22 was hotter than the year before, 23 was hotter than 22, and so forth. This year is, is not going to be any different, I don't think. So we really absolutely need to have more infrastructure and financing going into the electric grid and uh, leaving it up to utilities to do this, uh, they they need they need a big push. The National Infrastructure Bank will fi finance all of the transmission that's been identified by the American Society of Civil Engineers. And then I just wanted to remind you about the size of the National Infrastructure Bank. How did it come out uh, sized at five trillion? It was based on estimates in the ASCII 2021 report card of the funding gap over 10 years, how much is not being funded by budgets or by private companies, uh, which they estimated at $2.6 trillion in 16 categories. And then we added on much more for affordable housing, high-speed rail, water projects, that kind of thing. However, this is the 2021 report card. Now ASCII is getting ready to come out with a new report card, and they gave a glimpse of what the size of the financing gap will look like. 
Under, again, under the old report card, it was measured over 10 years at $2.6 trillion. Now, these are the funding gaps in all the major categories. Uh, the one that went up the most was for energy. I don't know why ASCII calls it energy, but what they really need mean is electric power. Uh, that gap went up from 197 billion to 578 billion. That indicates that now they, oh, now they realize that we need much more investment in the uh, energy grid. Drinking and wastewater systems went up by 100 billion to 999 uh, um, billion dollars. So uh, the, altogether, the gap has gone up from the 2.6 trillion on which the bank size is, is based right now to 3.4 trillion, and that assumes that there will be a second Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act over a five-year period in the mix. If uh, uh, if that doesn't happen, then the uh, the the gap. So the gap has increased under today's budgets. The gap has increased by seven hundred and thirty-three billion. If there's not a second IIJA, the gap will be one point five trillion higher than it is now. That means we're going to have to make our uh, infrastructure bank. 1.5 trillion higher than it is now, up to 6.6 .6 trillion dollars. So it's it's really something to think about. Um, the gap is rising even with the federal programs and state programs that we have in place right now. Recognizing this, many more uh, members of Congress have signed on to the bill. The total number now is 37, in, including, of course, the main sponsor, Rep. Danny Davis from Chicago, Illinois. And we have uh, many states representative. We have a few states where 100% of the members of Congress have come on board. But 37, we still have a long way to go. Uh, all of this was done by you, the grassroots effort, pestering your uh, and state legislators, pestering uh, members of Congress by saying, look, it's not enough. It's not enough. If we're going to fix our infrastructure, prevent any bridges from coming down, prevent our electric grid from going down, building affordable housing so people don't become homeless, then we have to sign on to this National Infrastructure Bank as the only plan uh, A to the rescue to get us out of our problems. So I'll stop there, pass it on to the next speaker. Thanks. Julie, you're on mute. Thanks, Alpeka. Re really appreciate that report. I, I think it's interesting to know you all saw that uh, list of representatives who have signed on to sponsor, but we have multiple members from the Progressive Caucus who have signed on and also uh, multiple members of the Problem Solvers or Blue Dog Caucus, which is a more conservative caucus of Democrats. So we're really getting a well-rounded group here that are signing up and appreciate everyone's support in, um, in helping us get those additional signers. Okay, next, um, I would like to go to California. We have with us uh, tonight uh, author and former managing director of Goldman Sachs and other Wall Street investment banks, uh, PhD and, and author, Dr. Nomi Prince. Nomi, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Julie. And, and Alfeca, as always, your, your presentations are so very detailed and so very depressing. <laughs> that it gives us only upside uh, for moving forward with the National Infrastructure Bank financing mechanism. Um, so I just wanted to actually talk a little bit about that financing mechanism. For those of you who've been on our calls before, you, you've heard a little bit of this. And for those of you who are new, I'm just gonna go through really quickly why we can provide financing for at the moment 5 trillion, but as Alfeca outlined, um, potentially up to $6.6 .6 trillion worth of uh, funding to decrease or basically get rid of that infrastructure gap that we currently face right now across all these categories as a nation. And it's a really simple mechanism that commercial banks have used basically forever. Um, and what it requires is repurposing debt that already exists. And, and that's a way for, by which this bank does not increase our debt burden, which is now $34.68 trillion. So it's going to be 35 trillion like almost before this meeting is finished but it's it's going there really quickly um and it doesn't increase our deficit so the way it does that is repurposing debt that already exists the way that happens is any state any institution that currently owns treasury bonds only a half a trillion dollars worth of them out of that 
$34.68 trillion that exist and pledges them as reserves to the National Infrastructure Bank and receives for that pledge of those treasuries 2% over those treasuries. So there's incentive for pension funds to basically swap out some treasuries they're holding into the bank. They're going to get more return. And then what the bank does is it can lend up to 10 times the amount of reserves that it has. This is a totally normal thing that banks do. In fact, during financial crises, some of these major investment banks like Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, both of whom I've worked for and neither of which exists right now, not because I worked for them, but it's just a thing, uh, they over leveraged. But the, the point is, if you're doing diligence and you're, you're, you're monitoring banking performance and the loan performance and the funding of infrastructure performance, then you have a very safe functional bank that only focuses on these categories of infrastructure funding. And because it has this kind of revolving mechanism. It means that as our needs increase or as inflation potentially increases, we are actually diminishing the cost of building infrastructure to meet that inflation because our treasuries come into the bank, we give extra percentages for them, and they're used to fund all these infrastructure projects around the country. Um, and I also wanted to talk a little bit more about the banks because last uh, week, about a week and a half ago, actually, the FDIC came out with a report where it said that Currently, right now, our banks, U.S. banks, are sitting on $517 billion, more than a half a trillion dollars, so more than what is needed to fund this national infrastructure bank of unrealized losses on their books. That means they are ticking time bonds. Most of these losses are in the commercial real estate and other real estate categories. That was a big cause, a uh, different part of real estate of the financial crisis of 2008. Then it was subprime, now it's commercial loans. The FDIC also said there are 63 banks across the nation that are designated as problem banks and $80 billion worth of their assets are underwater. So our financial system is not only not equipped to fund our infrastructure, they have way more problems than they can handle themselves. So these are the reasons why a viable um, financial uh, lending mechanism like the National Infrastructure Bank is so important right now. It can decrease the debt out of the system. It will not increase the deficit um, and it will also be flexibly created so it can fund all of these infrastructure projects. Um, and so I mentioned a little bit on housing and why some of the commercial real estate loans are at the heart of um, a lot of problems that banks are facing. When we talk about infrastructure on a physical nature, um, and I do want to underscore what Alfeca said about the power grid, if, if we um, have a power grid that doesn't fully function, um, which it doesn't right now because of brownouts, blackouts, and because it's simply old. And this is a problem in so much of our infrastructure. If we don't finance it now, if we don't fix it now, if we don't upgrade it now, then the cost does only get more expensive going forward, not just the cost of creating and up, updating and modernizing, but also just the human cost. Um, when fires happen, when people die, when bridges collapse, all of these things are basically preventable if we decide to finance our infrastructure. And this mechanism, um, just to underscore how global it is, is something that's used across the world. We invented it here in the United States, but across the world, in China, in Brazil, throughout Europe, um, we, we have these infrastructure development banks that don't create more debt, that simply take debt out of the system and build and strategize infrastructure. And we're actually falling behind as a nation because we don't have this mechanism, not only to compete with other nations, but also to build our own infrastructure. So for all these reasons, the timing right now is very, very critical. And what we are seeing, um, and some of you have been in these meetings for a long time, but what is very positive is not only do we have 37 co-sponsors on the federal level and all of the state legislations um, that are also co-sponsoring, but also we are seeing um, sort of that hand coming over across the aisle. We are meeting with Republicans. We are seeing more and more uh, local activism as well. In fact, over in California, if any of you are around in uh, July 1st, uh, we are actually, um, me and my husband are actually going to have a event for our Chamber of Commerce, for our City Council, Democrats, Republicans, everyone who wants to come can come to specifically learn more about the mechanics of the Central Structure Bank, how it helps on a local level, and then how it connects to the federal level going forward. And I think these are things that are also happening uh, throughout the country on the grassroots as well. Thanks, Novi. Really appreciate you being here. And I'm glad you brought up uh, the important work that's being done in the states because we have with us as our next speaker, a representative from Pennsylvania. Um, he is the chair of the Commerce Committee and was recently successful in getting our resolution passed through. 
in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. So I'd like to introduce Representative Scott Conklin and can you share a few words with us? I'll tell you what, I am sadly ill-equipped to speak to the body of which I'm for, which you have me before today. The work you all do is absolutely incredible. And as Sue and I have talked before, and please forgive me the, the way I'm dressed, it's been a long day and I've uh, we just got home. And by the way, if you're paying for the plane tickets to come to California, I really can't accept gifts, but you know, if it's for business, I'd be more than willing to, you know, to come out. Uh, the, you know, and the other hat I wear, as we've talked about before, I'm actually the state, I'm actually the uh, treasurer of the Pennsylvania State Democratic Party as well. But one of the things that you that this group does and does very masterfully is that you've been able to reach out to legislators such as myself and other legislators in state to state which gives us the ability then to, to move your message off for myself, John Fetterman and Bob Casey are both good friends of mine. So it gives me the, the opportunity to move your, your message along. But my third hat that we had talked about before in my previous life, I was national director for the Builders Association. And one of the things that we used to talk about, and I'm going back 25 years, was the infrastructure, the electrical grid, the power structures, in fact, one of the interesting meetings I just had was with the Pilots Association. That's if you follow if you're California or where you might be, is the bridge that was taken that was just knocked down by the ship. And, and one of the things we were talking about is that the amount of money it even takes just to keep those canals dredged, the, the infrastructure that it takes in. But what's most important, rather than me talking in circles and rather than me going on and on about it. What we're here to do, especially for myself, is that to help this group forward, because what you're doing with the banking institutions, the infrastructure across the board, we are been, this problem, as you well know, did not start in the last five, 10 years. It started 30, 40 years ago. And especially when you live outside of the urban area, infrastructure is one of the most important assets we have. If it wasn't for the infrastructure of the bridge programs, the road programs, the electrical infrastructure, the water, if you live in rural Pennsylvania, that's why I get so upset sometimes that it becomes a political issue that everyone believes that this money is going to go to whether it's Chicago or Pittsburgh or the, the, or Houston. But this money goes to rural Pennsylvania as well. If it wasn't for those roads coming through for transportation, we would not be able to survive. If it wasn't for the grid systems being put through, we would not be able to survive. But rather than me going on and on, I just want to thank you all for what you do. The the what you're doing, Stu, is absolutely an asset. He 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 keeps us abreast of everything that's going on. The rest of the members we've talked to, it's absolutely great working with you all, and that's what you do best. You brought us together. If we could just get some folks who understand how important what you do is, we'd be able to go a lot further. Unless you have something else for me, I the last thing I I, I want to do is to show what little bit I do know compared to you all, and it keeps me out of trouble this way. Thank you, Representative Conklin. Really appreciate you being here. And thanks for all your support in the, the House of Representatives there in Pennsylvania. Uh, next, we're going to go um, to back to Los Angeles. Um, we have Ellen Brown, who is the chair of the Public Banking Institute with us. Uh, there's been a resurgence of interest in public banking around the country. And I'd like to ask Ellen to share some thoughts with us tonight. As Elfeke and Nomi both pointed out, we don't have the money for the infrastructure that we need. And where is it going to come from then? We need some sort of workaround. Uh, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton faced a similar situation in 1791 when they had a $44 million debt from the Revolutionary War. And so Hamilton's solution was to turn the debt into capital for the first bank of the US. So state debt was accepted in partial payment for stock in the bank, paying a 6% dividend. So this bank would, NIB would pay a 2% dividend, similar model. Uh, the bank leveraged this capital into credit issued as the first US currency. Loans were to be for infrastructure and development based on the fractional reserve model. Hamilton wrote, it is a well-established fact that banks in good credit can circulate a far greater sum than the actual quantum of their capital in gold and silver. 
And that is, how, as Naomi pointed out, that is how banks still create money today. This is a quote from uh, the Bank of England 2014. Banks do not act simply as intermediaries lending out deposits that savers place with them, and nor do they multiply up central bank money to create new loans and deposits. Commercial banks create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. In fact, they said bank deposits make up 97% of the amount of money currently in circulation. And on the right there, you can see how that works. You start with a deposit of $100, assuming a 10% reserve requirement, you hold back 10, loan out 90, that 90 goes into another bank, which lends out 90%, et cetera, until you've lent out 10 times what you started with. <clears throat> um, so the, the off-budget financing mechanism was uh, modeled by the Reconstruction Finance Corporation during the Great Depression when the banks were bankrupt and obviously the government was not in great shape either. So under uh, Jesse Jones, Secretary of Commerce, the government repurposed the Refi Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which had been established by the previous president, uh, to to help the banks and it didn't really work. So it was greatly expanded to fund development. They started with a modest $500 million in capitalization. They issued bonds, it was not actually a bank. Lenter invested over $40 billion over the next 25 years, funded the New Deal, rebuilt the um, economy, funded World War II and re actually returned a net profit to the government. So it was actually a money maker for the government. And they did all that, $40 billion in new, um, new loans without uh, creating price inflation. As you can see on this chart, it didn't really, inflation didn't really take off until, <laughs> until the 1960s, Vietnam War, et cetera. So why was it not inflationary? Sorry, because uh, supply increased with demand. So GDP went up along with, with the money. Um, Inflation results from too much money chasing too few goods. So if your goods go up at the same rate as the money, you don't get inflation. Uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was actually called a workaround. Uh, according to James Butkowitz, professor of economics at the University of Delaware, the RFC was an executive agency with the ability to obtain funding through the treasury outside of the normal legislative process. Thus, the RFC could be used to finance a variety of favored projects and programs without obtaining legislative approval and actually without getting, they actually borrowed from the federal government. But again, the, even though the debt went up, the GDP went up, so it wasn't a problem. And China has uh, funded its massive infrastructure uh, achievements in the same way or similar way. Uh, China built 26,000 miles of high-speed rail in a mere 15 years, along with the world's largest dam and power station. So how did they fund it? The government owns 80% of Chinese banking assets, including three massive development banks led by China Development Bank. Uh, China Development Bank is not a depository bank, but it's funded with government-backed bonds. The high-speed rail system is self-sustaining. So using the fair revenue model. So the revenue from the ticket sales is reinvested in maintenance and expansion. And again, so China's money supply actually increased by 1800% over 23 years. So that's like a factor of 18, 18 times. And still it wasn't inflationary. You can see at the bottom um, chart is inflation. Why not? Because uh, GDP, GDP went up at the same rate. Supply went up along with demand. Uh, so we can do that as well with the HR 4052, the National Infrastructure Bank Bill. This bank, this bill will be a bank, unlike the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Um, capitalized the first, like the first U.S. bank with uh, federal securities paying a 2% dividend, redeemable after 20 years. Uh, it will lend $5 trillion over or more, as <laughs> Becca just pointed out, we need more, um, over a period of years for infrastructure, specifically for infrastructure and development. And it can curb inflation by actually generating supply, which will rise to meet a line, to meet um, the increase in the money supply. And oops, <laughs> uh, a national infrastructure or public banks in general can lend at the lowest possible interest rates. Uh, if you compare private banks and public-private partnerships, which has been proposed so far, 
uh, private, they all want uh, a hefty profit. So private banks want at least the prime rate, which is the rate at which they lend to their best customers, plus a 3% spread. So that's uh, 12% today. And private investors also want a big profit on top of what they lend. Whereas public banks using the depository money multiplier model can charge near the treasury bond rate or the Fed funds rate plus 2%. So a mere, so it still sounds high, but it's 7% today. And you might ask, well, if local governments are already in debt, how are they going to repay these loans? Uh, they can fund the loans with revenue bonds, which is what was done in the Great Depression. So the revenues generated by the infrastructure produced by the loan can be used to repay the loan. For example, in California, we have the situation right now where we have 42 dams that need to be repaired, but because they don't have the we don't have the money to repair them, they they're not producing what they could produce uh, due to safety concerns. So there's a cap on what they're allowed to produce. Repairing the dams, it's been estimated, could generate additional water. Um, estimated to be enough to serve 3.6 million people for a year. So, so you would raise, that would increase uh, the revenues you would get from the water and that revenue could go back to repay the loan from the National Infrastructure Bank. So that's all I got, thank you very much. Thanks, Ellen, and really appreciate that last example in terms of how a state or local government entity would actually be able to generate the money to repay the loan. So I thought that was a really great example. Um, now, on our phone call this evening, we have multiple people from Washington State on the line, as well as Senator Hasegawa. And all of these folks were instrumental in getting one of our most recent co-sponsors, Representative Pramila Jayapal. So with that, I'd like to introduce Senator Robert Hasegawa from Washington State. And thank you for being here. And can you talk to us a little bit about your interest in the, the National Infrastructure Bank? Ah, oh, thanks, Julie. Yeah, it's a pleasure being on the same call with uh, Ellen Brown, who we've worked together for many years on public banking. So great to see Ellen. Um, so in, you know, in Washington State, um, we passed a joint memorial to support this, which pretty much explains my interest in it. You know, a joint memorial is something that passes both chambers of the legislature, the House and the Senate, and um, was a a statement of our intentions and desires to all of our congressional delegation, uh, to Congress and the president to please pass the National Infrastructure Bank proposal 4052 and for the president to sign on to it. So uh, because of that, I think we were able to get a couple of Congress people to sign it. But the real question is, why don't they all sign it? I mean, it's a bipartisan issue. And if you talk to, I, I'm a Democrat. If you talk to Republicans one-on-one, -on -one, they kind of get it, but they're not willing to take that step to actually promote it or support it publicly. Um, however, I, I've talked with some of the um, libertarian side of the Republican Party, and they are actually supportive of it and don't mind coming out and saying they support it because they want independence from Wall Street and corporate domination just as much as we all do. So it it really is a bipartisan issue. And, you know, it, it's one of those things where, I mean, I'm talking to the choir. Everybody here on this call probably is supportive of it. So... Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to sell it to any of y'all because you're already sold. Um, I just want to ask the question, what is the messaging? What is the strategy that's going to get us over the finish line to convince the people whose signatures we need on a bill to actually support it? it it's like in Washington State, we have well, actually, it's the second most regressive. We were the most regressive tax state in the country because we did not have a progressive income tax. Our, our revenue base was solely structured around sales tax and property tax. 
we since passed the capital gains tax, which moved us from 50th place to 49th. So small victories, I guess. But the, the point I'm trying to make is, why is it so difficult to get people to support what's in your own self-interest? A progressive income tax would be in everybody's uh, the vast majority's own self-interest. National Infrastructure Bank would be in everybody's own self-interest. So I guess the, the intellectual question is, how do we get there? I mean, that's the $5 trillion question, I guess you might say. Um, is it fear? by legislators um they don't seem to be afraid to take the wrong position so i don't know if it's necessarily fear or ignorance um just an unwillingness to take a, a strong political stand i mean we're talking about a proven model here not just through ellen's examples of the reconstruction finance corporation but i mean you look at every other country in the world that's doing great stuff and you know, Germany, why does Germany even have a public banking system? One of the reasons is because after World War II and the Marshall Plan, we weren't going to finance the redevelopment, but we knew that they needed resources to be able to rebuild the country. So it was part of our requirement that they have their own public bank. Same with Japan. Um so it was our policy for them to have it, but we can't have it ourselves. It doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm sorry if I'm speaking and sounding a little frustrated by all of this, but I, I'm looking to you all to help us figure out the solutions. You know, we've had, I've had a public banking bill here since the, the Great Recession, uh, which triggered my first public bank bill. So it's been like, what? 14, 15 years now that I've actually had a bill on the books to create a, a state bank for the state of Washington. We'll be going at it again. And I'm working with a couple of folks on this call um, from Washington State that you referred to. Um, we'll be coming up with at least one, if not multiple options. Uh, give, give a smorgasbord to pick from maybe and see what's palatable. Uh, but the National Infrastructure Bank our, our infrastructure was built, but when was the electrical grid made? It was through the De Great Depression. I mean, the, these things were built decades and decades ago for a population of a country that's half the size of what it is now. Our water and sewer infrastructure is not capable of uh, handling the amount of housing that we have to build, which we're not even capable of building that amount of housing. Uh, so the need is overwhelming, and I see it as actually inevitable at some point. But how much pain are we willing to suffer before we wake up to the realization that it is inevitable? We have to create our own public bank to be able to finance all of the infrastructure we need. So I'm um, looking to you for solutions. I don't have them, but... Uh, that's my part. And like Ellen said, that's all I got. Thank you, Senator Hasegawa. We, uh, we appreciate you being here. And um, I, I guess if you're asking the audience about what should we do to, um, to get everybody on board, to me, it's we have to spend more time talking to each other. And it seems like there's just such excessive partisanship going on that we don't have those honest conversations with people. And so I would just encourage everybody here to reach out and talk to somebody who's not like you and does not maybe think like you because we need to, you know, breach that gap somehow. But that's just my opinion. Anyway, let's move on to another one of our esteemed guests this evening. And we are fortunate to have with us tonight, Senator Bill Tallman from New Mexico. Um, New Mexico is one of those states that's had their complete congressional delegation sign on as co-sponsor. So we are so pleased to uh, have the support of the folks in New Mexico and Senator Tallman here tonight. So um, Bill, you're on and you're muted. There we go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. 
So good evening, everyone. Very pleased to be able to do, uh, speak to you this evening. Um, I've been asked to uh, reiterate uh, what Julie just said, and that is that we one of only two states that have, uh, where all of our congressional members, not Senate, but two uh, House members have uh, signed on to the bill. Of course, uh, we only have three, so um, it wasn't a, uh, per, per, <clears throat> a difficult task, uh, although I've been asked to, to say that it was a, a difficult task. Um, we, uh, it, it's been, uh, we've been working on it for over two years, and um, uh, the, the first two uh, that we were able successfully uh, to sign on um, are both in a, a fairly uh, safe uh, district. But the third uh, member we just signed on uh, earlier this year is Representative uh, Gabe uh, Vasquez, uh, who is is in a literally a 50-50 race, one of the, the tightest races of the country in the southern part of, of New Mexico. Um, the, he uh, and uh, he beat a woman uh, two years ago who uh, had held the position. So uh, she had it from twenty to twenty-two, and um, no, I don't. I'm sorry, a Democrat had it for twenty to twenty-two, and then uh, uh, a woman um, who was a, a Republican won. And then in 22, then it, uh, it was taken over by uh, Representative Vasquez, who was running again this year. He only won uh, last time by uh, a couple of thousand votes. So it could go either way. And um, But the point is, uh, even though he's in a tight race, uh, we were able to convince him that uh, this is a good thing to do. Um, because uh, we we told them uh, and we pointed out to them the overwhelming needs of, of New Mexico uh, that would be met by this bill, and uh, he told us, "quote It is a no-brainer." Period. So um, we, we uh, had a tough time, but uh, we, we we got it done. Um, so. I just returned from a couple of weeks in Europe. You know, the infrastructure over there will blow you away. High speed, 15,000 miles of high speed rail. Um, I literally, I don't, I was there two weeks. I, I can honestly say I didn't see one pothole. And, um, and in, in Germany, uh, I didn't see any, uh, any billboards, which certainly beautifies the, uh, the countryside. Uh, I just drove. 50 miles to Santa Fe today and back, and uh, we have a beautiful countryside, and it's marred by ugly billboards. You know, in Europe, in, uh, the infrastructure really is, is amazing, but and, and they consider it uh, an investment. In the United States, we consider it an expense, and which is a whole different way of looking at things. And in Europe, of course, they have a sense of community. Um, they're more willing to help out, willing to pay taxes for something they may not benefit from. Or in the United States, you know, we're not as likely, you know, if it doesn't benefit us like directly, we're not as likely to to uh, want to contribute, which explains why uh, a big difference, helps explain a big difference between the two countries. Um, in, in Europe, they spend... Uh, 5% of their GDP on infrastructure. China spends 8%. United States only spends 2.5%. So we're, we're sadly, we're, we're falling behind the rest of the world. And um, if it, and because we're not keeping up in, with infrastructure, if we can't move people and in, in, in goods faster, we're, we're just gonna be uh, fall, falling farther uh, um, and farther behind. So, in the United States, uh, we, of course, as already been mentioned, we never, haven't been able to uh, never been able to finance uh, infrastructure through the budgetary um, process. We have fights on 
heavy line item and the net result is that our infrastructure ranks among the, the least productive. Um, you know, the, the, the infrastructure bill that Biden signed in uh, November of 21, it far, falls far short of the need. But just to give you an example here in uh, New Mexico, um, we have the second sunniest state and the fifth windiest, so we have a lot of potential to produce uh, renewable energy, and yet there was no money. There were, there were 13 categories in the Biden bill, and one of them was the electric grid. We get receiving no money for that. We also, I've seen uh, high-speed rail. We're receiving no money for high-speed rail, even though I've seen maps of the proposed routes of high-speed rail. And the first route west of Mississippi would go to, from Mississippi to California would go through New Mexico. No money for, for uh, high-speed uh, rail. Infra water infrastructure. Uh, we had the state engineer quit a couple of years ago because he said he needed $2 billion for water infrastructure. And we only get 350,000 or 360 million from the Biden bill, which is only one sixth of uh, what we need. And interestingly enough, 74 cents of every dollar we're getting from the Biden bill is going for bridges, roads and bridges. So you can make a good argument that that's not our, you know, that's not our greatest need. It, it, the disproportionate amount going to bridge and road, bridge, roads and bridges, especially in light of the fact we're getting no money for, for high-speed rail and that insufficient amount of money for water infrastructure and no money for electric uh, grid. So that's a um, huge problem. Um, so, um, we, I support HR 4052 and have supported the National Figure Bank now for three years. And, um, and that is why my colleagues and I spent countless hours educating our members of Congress because it's such a critical need. Um, they have all signed the bill that we were successful in. in and convincing them that this is extremely important. Um, so I would urge everyone on the call tonight to do the same with your members. There is no substitute for the NIV. It's the only answer. When, when the current infrastructure law expires, um, how will we meet the needs? So I think we were successful with our congressmen because we were persistent and we were persuasive and we were, were, and we were uh, personal. And we approached them in a and a, a kindly man. So thank you for listening and y'all have a great evening. Thank you, Senator Tallman for all your support there in New Mexico. We appreciate it. Okay, next we'd like to go to the other side of the country. Uh, we have with us this evening uh, from the Massachusetts State Senate, Senate, Senator Michael Moore from Worcester, Mass. Senator thank you. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, so I am first going to apologize. I am at a local event, so you may hear music and people um, enjoying themselves in the background. So I apologize for that. But I didn't want to miss out on this uh, opportunity to really express the need for the National Infrastructure Bank. You know, Massachusetts, we all know, one of the first states of this country. And being one of the first states means we have some of the oldest infrastructure. Uh, we've got 5,200 bridges. 8.7% of those bridges are structurally deficient. 50%, 57% of our roads are in poor condition or fair condition. 1,200 miles of roads are in poor condition. Commute times have increased 11% since 2011. And motorists spend on average $620 per year driving on roads in needs of repair. We have 478,000 renters in Massachusetts. What, what we consider rent burden. We are in need of more than 220, 220,000 units of affordable housing. Uh, we have multi billion dollar shortfalls in drinking and water, wastewater infrastructure. We have about 117,000 lead water service lines needing immediate replacement, an estimated cost of one to two billion. 2.5% 2. 2. of our population live in areas where they don't have broadband infrastructure. 
So these are just some of the expenses that we have to look at on the state level. And obviously, you know, we don't have the resources to cover all these expenses. So this is where the states and governments, the federal government has to work together. But the problem I think we all can acknowledge right now is that, and no disrespect to our colleagues in Washington, it's, it's very hard for any sort of infrastructure or funding bills to come through in a bipartisan manner. Uh, we need to have these projects evaluated on the worthiness of these projects. We, by having the creation of an infrastructure bank, we can take it out of the political process that's in. We can have, an, we can have a process or an institution that is going to evaluate the projects on the need of the project. Um, I mean, just look at how many times we've seen government come to an almost closure. And at the last minute, it's saved. When's the last time the federal government has, has had a budget? Uh, we, we're operating under continuing resolutions. And to me, that's just not an efficient way for these projects to get funded or evaluated. And it's hard for states to then depend on um, the necessary refunding or the cooperation from our partners in Washington um, to accomplish all the needs of all the needs and the, what I think our uh, citizens expect for living in the United States. Um, you know, at one time we probably had the, the, our infrastructure probably exceeded anyone in the world, but I think it's been talking, talked, spoken before about, you know, we've seen uh, Europe far exceeding us in certain areas. Um, so I think we got an opportunity here to take to take the investment of our infrastructure out of out, out of the political process and put it into a process where um, we're going to have professionals who are going to have the expertise to evaluate evaluate the project. Also, look at uh, by selling the treasury bonds and investing that we're going to have experts in these fields who are going to make the proper investments and have a long-term growth or goal for our country to move forward. So again, I just want to thank everyone here and I apologize for uh, any background noise and um, where I'm speaking from, but um, I just think it's very important that we try to get more, more of our congressmen or federal legislators on board because uh, this really is important. Thank you, Senator Moore. You know, one of the things that's been really interesting for me on these calls month in and month out is the commonality of infrastructure concerns that we have around the country. So, Senator Moore, you mentioned issues with lack of broadband capability, but we've heard that that's an issue in places like Delaware and New Mexico as well. So, so the, there's commonality. We have those issues all around the country. And it's great to see people from all over the country joining in on these calls and supporting the work that we're doing. You know, another thing, so, another, another thing I just um, I meant to mention too is, you know, right now, I don't know of any state that doesn't have a gas tax. And that gas tax is usually money that's invested back in our road infrastructure, transportation infrastructure. But as you see, uh -huh. our, as we see the evolution of electric vehicles, that's a diminishing return on revenue. So every state is going to need to replace that revenue somewhere to maintain our, our transportation infrastructure. And this is a this is a perfect fit for helping um, helping those states that may see it may see a decline in that uh, those revenue resources. That's that's a good point. More more long term planning needs to be done. Yes. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so we're going to get to our Q and A here in a minute, but um, I want to first of all let everybody know that we are still working very strongly on our campaign to get additional co-sponsors. Representative Jackson, are you on the line? Good afternoon. How are you all doing? Pretty good. How about you? Uh, I'm I'm doing well, and I have to ditto the conversations I've heard from other Congress uh, senators and and representatives from their states. Alabama is no different. As a matter of fact, we may be worse than they are because we have a, a super red and uh, we can't get too much done in our legislature with the super majority Republican uh, state and Senate, House and Senate. Uh, I've introduced that resolution over many years of the infrastructure. Can't even get it out of rules anymore. So it's it's just it's just it's just that we are in a bad situation. But I, I look at the, the allergies here, the analogies of uh what Noah did 
before the flood, 120 years of talking about a rain, is flood is coming. Nobody accepted it. Nobody believed it. Nobody bought into it. And that's where we are right now as a nation. So uh, what you're doing is a tremendous work. We have broadband expansion here from the inf infrastructure uh, bill that was passed in Congress. And I want to say that no, no Alabama uh, Congress people voted for that bill, but one Democrat, and that was Terry Sewell. No senator voted for it, uh, and, and, and just uh, one representative out of the seven. Uh, but we received the funding. We're boasting on the money that's coming in. So we have infrastructure for bridges and uh, water and sewage. So those are things that try to bring us out of the dark ages because without water and sewage, we can't move forward with nothing else, with no no economic development. So we're, we're, we're still in, in, in a situation where we're trying to get things done for the, the least, the most least of the people in this state. And it's hard to get that done through a super majority Republican uh, legislature. Yeah. Uh, Tom, what part of Alabama are you from? I'm in the southwest portion of Alabama. I'm 65, 70 miles southwest of Selma. Oh, well. Right, right below the Black there. Belt. Right you've, got big, the Black. you've got a big port there in Mobile. I would think there'd be some concerns around that. and and, and Great funding for the port. Yes, they're trying to expand it. And, and it's going to be a very productive port when, this, when all this is done. Because there's a lot of business coming through that port as it relates to uh, Mercedes shipping cars from from the plants to Europe, and you got uh, several automotive plants that are going to be using that that uh, that that port. And there's a infrastructure for winding the 43 highway, four laning it from Tuscaloosa to Mobile. So we're looking at some expansion in this southwest portion of the state. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. So before we get to the Q and A, um, I want to just reiterate that we can use your help in contacting your members of Congress in your state. So uh, we need all of the co-sponsors we can get. We've been told we need to get to critical mass as far as the number of co-sponsors. And we think we're, we're edging up there. We've been really successful this year in getting additional signers. And if you would like some help from the coalition in contacting your member of Congress, we are happy to help. So you see here our phone number and uh, email address. So please feel free to give us a call or email, and we're happy to help you with some efforts to contact the member of Congress in your state. Uh, then I wanted to let everybody know that we are working very hard to have some influence at both of the, the major parties' conventions this summer, uh, the Republicans in Milwaukee and the Democrats in Chicago. We are, uh, we've are we got a concerted effort going to be able to do a presentation at the, um, the DNC convention in Chicago. We're really hopeful that that's going to come off, but, and we're working to have some influence and be able to have a discussion at the RNC convention also. So if you are a delegate or if you are intending on attending one of the conventions and um, I would like to work with us in terms of providing some information, potentially a, a webinar or a forum, we would love to chat with you about what we can do to have a presence at both of these very important events this summer. And then um, finally, I just want to remind everybody about our National Infrastructure Bank action page. This is located on our website at nibcoalition.com. You can find the action page, and this is going to give you information. We also have a downloadable flyer. So if you're kind of thinking to yourself, oh, I'll never be able to remember all those details about the bank when I talk to my my uh, local representative or my uh, state uh, senator, you can download the flyer and hand that to um, hand it to your friends, your relatives, your coworkers, and of course to any of your elected representatives to help us educate people on this really important topic. So please visit our website. And when you're on our website, you might see on the very front of it that little red donate button there, because I want to remind everybody that this is a truly grassroots coalition. We don't have any big uh, funders. We don't have any uh, billionaires that are writing us big checks. 
So we depend on donations from you all to be able to put on these webinars, to maintain our, our office, our website. And, and of course, if we're gonna make a presence at the, uh, the conventions, that can be a, a pretty spendy proposition. So any um, donations that you are able to make to help us out, we greatly appreciate that. So um, with that, I'd like to go right to the Q&A. So if you have, uh, a question for any of our speakers, or you have a comment you'd like to make, um, please raise your hand or wave your hand in the um, on screen, and we'll be happy to get to you. And um, in the meantime, um, is Representative Conklin still on the phone? I'm not sure. I had a question for him. And uh, then I also want to take the opportunity here to pick on somebody who I believe is from Florida. Scott Coons, are you on the line? Yes, good evening, Julie. And now you live in Florida, right, Scott? I, w I certainly do. And what with all the floods, flooding and everything that's been happening recently there in Miami and other parts of Southern Florida, are any of the elected officials in Florida talking about a long range plan to deal with rising sea levels? I mean, wh what is their thinking about addressing uh, the infrastructure needs because of that? Um, the state is beginning to recognize uh, the need to adapt to rising sea level. And we had portions of Southern Florida this past week that got 20 inches of rain over a two day period. Some areas got four to six inches in a two hour period. Uh, extensive flooding. The uh, Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport was flooded and closed for a period of time, and uh, it's becoming an increasing issue. And uh, we have occasion we have flooding now just from uh, full King moons. Uh, no rain, just uh, rising uh, sea level from the gravity of the moon, bringing water uh, into low lying areas. But uh, critical needs. Uh, Eighty percent of our population lives within uh, several miles of the coast. So it's, it's a serious issue for our state and uh, we don't have the resources to begin to retrofit the infrastructure to, to deal with that issue. The National Infrastructure Bank would be a mechanism for addressing that problem. Do you feel that, um, are, are people starting to rethink um, living in Florida as a consequence of these issues or is that really kind of not happening just yet? Not happening yet, uh, particularly Southeast Florida, Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach counties uh, continue to increase in population. And uh, while there are probably a handful of folks, a couple hundred that maybe are moving further inland and further north, but uh, folks continue to flock to uh, the Southeast Florida coast. Hmm, interesting. All right, well, um, I wonder how, <laughs> I personally wonder how high the sea level has to rise before people start you know, rethinking that and kind of go, hey, it's time to get out of here before my feet get too wet. But anyway, thank you for, for being here and sharing that information. Um, and look at that. I see Don Seafkid's hand is up. Don has been one of our stalwart supporters and has uh, come up with some ideas on uh, bringing more water to the drought-stricken areas in the Southwest. And Don, you've got your hand up. Do you have a question or a comment? And you're on mute. Oh, there yeah, you go. Well, I, just, I just have a comment. I've been thinking about this a lot. And uh, Bob Hasegawa, the Senator from Washington, hit the nail on the head when he says, you know, we're all preaching to the choir on this show. But I'm thinking, it's just, we got to somehow get Alfeca and Nomi Prince on television somehow. I don't know how to do that, okay? I've written a jillion letters to Stuart Varney trying to get him to invite Alfeca or Nomi onto his show, but I've never had a response from him. But Maybe I shouldn't focus on Varney, but anybody has any ideas on local television stations that could invite Nomi or Alfeca or Stu or you, Julie, onto the TV shows to get something going on television? I, I read an article the other day that said that nothing happens in this country anymore unless we can get on television. So I think we need to try to focus on that a bit more. I don't know how to do it, but... Uh, Anyway, I just want to throw that out there to this whole group. Uh, you know, anybody that works at a local TV station, which I don't, I wish I did, talk to them about trying to get an interview with uh, our, what do you call them, uh, experts on this subject. That's all I have to say. 
Thank you. I think that's a really great comment. And we, we've we actually gotten that um, comment from a few different people. Why can't we get on television? Well, we're trying. So, And of course, if we had some really big donations, we could pay for uh, the advertising. So, you know, anybody who's so inclined, you can get out your checkbook. Uh, okay, so we have uh, Joe Polito. You've got your hand up. Do you have a question or a comment? Well, I'd just like to follow up with that excellent comment that was just made. Um, you know, perhaps in social media, we could have uh, uh, short little videos comparing, you know, Chinese subways versus American subways, Chinese railroads, European railroads versus American, uh, you know, bridges, or whatever, pictures, uh, just little clips that can go viral. Um, Alfeca and the rest of your guests make a great job of going deep into the the weeds but you've got to kind of reach the public on an emotional level and maybe uh embarrass the nation a little bit we're not you know doing the things that are absolutely essential and then you've got the obviously a terrific uh, mechanism to right that wrong that's a great comment, Joe. Uh, we have actually had some interns, young people interning with us. And if anybody knows a young person who potentially would like to uh, donate their time and volunteer to help us out with doing some TikTok videos, I think that would be that's a really great idea. I know on the show, we've had a few people show examples of, for example, a subway in China or South Korea and a subway in New York City, just sort of illustrating the difference in quality in terms of the infrastructure people in Europe or in China might experience versus what we have in the US. And I think those would be great topics for uh, a TikTok video. So if, if anybody knows a young person or if you yourself ha uh, have some skills in terms of doing little uh, TikTok videos, we would love to talk to you about helping us out on that. We've got another Washingtonian with her hand up, Ingrid Clare. I, do you have a question or a comment? Hi. Yes, I agree with the uh, people that want to get the television, you know, get out there. I think also the press would be good and also podcasts because a lot of podcasts have um, people that, you know, would would be interested in this. Um, I just don't know how to get to them. But if anybody does, I think that would be a great avenue. That's all. Thank you, um, and um, we'll we'll put some thought into it and see what we can come up with. Um, meantime, I'd like to go back to Senator Moore from Massachusetts and ask him, how did you hear about the infrastructure bank? I'm, I'm curious as to how you how you heard about it and how you came to be a supporter. I Is Senator he's not Moore on, Julie. Oh, he's not on. Okay. All right, well, um, how about, um, let's see here, who else did we I have? Think Senator Hasegawa is still on, yes. Okay, Senator Hasegawa, I see you've got your hand up. Do you have a question or a comment for us? Oh, just a quick question. So a critical mass of uh, co-sponsors was mentioned. Do you have a number of what that critical mass might be? No, I, I don't have a number. This is just something that we were told. We needed a critical mass, but of course, what what that number is is you know, I, I don't know. Over fifty, so that means at least thirteen more. And you know, the thing is, is we actually have some really high profile uh, co-signers. So we look at um, Representative Jayapal from Seattle. Obviously, she's a powerhouse in the House of Representatives. Uh, we have Raul Grijalva from Arizona. We have AOC from New York City. So we do have some, you know, very well-known members, but but we need more. And of course, uh, we need Republicans. And that's, you know, just some of the feedback that we've gotten from people is that they want to see bipartisanship. So we've been working really hard on trying to get uh, Republicans and um to uh, be brave and to agree to, you know, sort of break that logjam. We, you know, we get a lot of positive comments from Republicans, uh, Republican staffers, and but people are nervous about being the lone Republican to, you know, sign up on a bill that's, you know, mostly Democrat. So we might need to get a whole group of them to sign up at once. 
So we're working on that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, Ellen um, Brown from the Public Banking Institute. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the states where we are seeing a lot of interest in public banking? I know you've got active groups, I think they're in multiple states right now, don't you? Yes, we have bills that are, um, we think are very close to being passed in New Mexico for one and uh, uh, the East Bay in California is another that they think they're very close. Massachusetts is another, New York City has a good bill. We have quite a few bills, but some of them are languishing, but those are the ones that are really moving forward. And um, so for, this is for Ellen, and uh, perhaps Nomi could weigh in on this. Do you see um, state banks, state public banks, being able to uh, provide funding for public infrastructure, or are they just not big enough to really be able to have much impact? How, how do you see that division between a national infrastructure bank and a, and a state public bank? Well, a national infrastructure bank would definitely have more impact, but a state like you could look at North Dakota, which is has our only state state owned bank at the moment, and they definitely um, fund a lot of infrastructure. Certainly in California, we need it. I mean, California has two hundred billion dollars, or they did, in revenues that theoretically could go into a a public bank if you leverage that would be that would be a Ten times two hundred billion, so that'd be two trillion in uh, potential infrastructure money. Okay, Nomi, do you have a comment on that? Judith. Just to echo Ellen, obviously, a, a, a larger institution um, will will have more value um, across states, and the the way in which the legislation is, which is really cool about the National Infrastructure Bank, is that it actually looks at the idea of connecting from the local up through the state through the federal level, so that you can actually do products like bridges between states to um, to inside com or commerce or or power grids across multiple states. So that if one side is down or weak. Um, something else can plenish that while we're you know moving more types of energy onto the grid or having more um, advanced technologies that can make energy more efficient, but we can't actually connect them into a, a grid. Um, so, so there's lots of ways in which um, this idea, and again, it, it's not to just create money, and I, I just want to sort of underscore that it, it is to basically provide lending against collateral, which are existing treasuries. So again, it's taking debt out of the system in order to use as collateral like other banks do in order to fund very specific um, infrastructure projects across the country. And I think that's one of the reasons we have so many co-sponsors at this point. Um, the last Congress we had um, far less co-sponsors. And I think what happens is, and this is why um, I, I really like these calls and what we're doing, and everybody's working so very hard across the states, across the coalition and everything else and all these initiatives, is that there is a moment in time where that need, and, and, and yes, we all know that it is now, but when that need is so undeniable as opposed to just quantifiable, and it sounds so massive, but it's undeniable where Congress people uh, across the aisle, and, and even you know ones in party, you know, in the Democratic Party have already, you know, which have had some signers, but but not others, um, basically recognize that this is a viable solution for an existing situation, an existing problem. It's not a solution looking for a problem. It's just a question of the time meeting uh, and marrying the problem with the solution, which is the National Infrastructure Bank. And so um, I, I think the momentum that we are seeing um, recently is testament to what we've been doing, but also again, that that undeniability meeting the moment. Um, and I and I do see that uh, the more momentum that we have and the more we we, we talk about these questions and, and, and again, make it very clear, um, which is I think important in the media also with the Democrats and Republicans, right? Just make it clear, this is not about creating money. This is about providing a financing mechanism that uses existing debt 
in a regular commercial bank regulated manner in order to provide specific lending to infrastructure projects from the local, state, and national um, levels and, and combined. Um, and that not only provides, going back to what Alfeca said, great paying jobs and a, and a growing economy to combat any inflationary pressures, which we will continue to have. That's just the reality of where we are right now historically and from a supply chain perspective. It, it, it also promotes the idea of a flexible mechanism that is off budget that can be used in order to continue to grow the necessary uh, infrastructure to meet the gap we have now and, and, and for whatever we may have in the future. So it's a big idea. Um, but again, it's it, the momentum is showing that that, that idea is meeting the, the undeniability of the moment. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, we've got quite a few people with their hands up. Why don't we go with uh, Randy Grind from Washington State. Randy, do you have a question or a comment? Well, uh, I, I have a, con a, a comment or two. I'll keep them quick. Uh, and I do have a question. Uh, the comment is that it's I'm really pleased that so many people are talking about this as investment because it is, uh, and it's it's a little bit shocking that much of the uh, financial industry is not interested in investing in things that grow uh, the economy. They're interested in a quick buck. Um, I'm, uh, but the question I have is in part to Senator Senator Hasegawa. Um, and that is uh, a comment on the uh, the editorial in uh, the Sunday Seattle Times on Washington's next governor faces rocky road when it comes to transportation. Um, it's by uh, Times Opinion columnist Josh Farley, and he rightly points out that there are some concerns about the state having enough money for this. And it's like he's never heard of the of the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, this would be a great place to get some point um, uh, some 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 point advertising or publicity simply by challenging him to take a look at the Infrastructure Bank. Uh, have you seen this, Bob? Senator Hasegawa. Uh, yes, I did. Um... The Seattle Times um, published an article and called me something not very favorable and said it was pie in the sky stuff. <laughs> and, nope, that's what their editorial board said. Hmm. I should focus on reality. <laughs> They're not the brightest bulbs um, there, I'm afraid, but the figures. Well, we'll keep trying. I Obviously, we still have work to do. So we've been, you know, spending a lot of time educating the masses out there, but apparently we have not gotten to the editorial board of the Seattle Times just yet. Um, okay, thank you, Randy. Uh, now let's go with uh, John Asher. John, where are you from, and do you have a question or a comment? Oh yes, I'm. I'm the I'm the secret webmaster behind the NIB. I'll just tell you oh. I have. Yeah. <laughs> I do the videos also. So here I am. Okay. I'm, I'm from uh, Stu land, okay? I'm here in Northern Virginia in Loudoun County. So uh, basically my question has to do with kind of indirectly addressing the political environment because despite all the intense partisanship uh, and attacks, et cetera, there strikes me as one area of convergence uh, which where in some way I think we could address more directly, which is that uh, over the course of the Biden administration, you see this with uh, Trump and what he's addressing coming in. There's discussion of what now is called industrial policy. And uh, this is typified by the, uh, the, you know, the CHIPS Act. Uh, there's things similar to that related to Trump around this group called the American Compass, uh, which is uh, connected to Rubio, which has not completely dissimilar ideas. And it just strikes me that since, you know, particularly since COVID and the addressing of the failure of the supply chain, that the NIB uh, is, it, it just puts a different edge on the necessity because if you're going to address the question of expansion of industry, it's inconceivable without uh, talking about elements of the infrastructure. For example, this is not exactly hard infrastructure, but 
one of the problems around the CHIPS Act has been that um, they have found uh, that they, they just don't have the educated workforce to reproduce what is going on in Taiwan. Right? They're just, they're, it just is not that workforce here and it's taking much longer and it's much harder. And of course, similarly, uh, without going into too many details, you also have the everything related now to AI and the vast uh, impact that is having on the electric grid, which is just, we're only seeing a, the, this, the beginning of this. I mean, here in Loudoun County, you can, I mean, you feel like you're going to wake up in the morning and there's going to be another one of these, you know, data centers in your backyard, what they are literally in my backyard. So they're just kind of sprouting like mushrooms. Uh, that's my first just issue I'm addressing, partly in response to Senator Hasegawa in terms of how we can kind of package this in a more bipartisan way to address things which are being seen by in both parties. Secondly, I've always been very curious about the ASCE in terms of the extreme weather and the impact on estimating the actual cost of, or the level in which we say we're bringing infrastructure up to a certain standard. Have those standards in reality been shifted as a result of the reality of what we're in now? And I just I just have this sneaking suspicion the answer to that is no. And, and if, if that this is somehow a kind of legacy calculations. And if that was done, what would the impact be in terms of the required total size of the infrastructure bank? So it's kind of one comment and then one kind of general uh, question. Okay, thank you. Uh, why don't we go in uh, to Alfeca and see if you'd like to address both of those uh, questions or comments. So in terms of the American Society of Civil Engineers, I mean, uh, they had a big wake up call with their revisions of uh, need for um, electric power. Uh, that, that was the biggest increase in the size of the gap uh, was for the electric grid. I don't think they paid too much attention to it on the last report card and, and it's been a wake up call. But altogether, um, our infrastructure needs better coordination and much more resiliency to protect, say, the electric grid from wildfires, from storms, from, uh, you know, sea level rises, all that kind of thing. Uh, I think they've just sort of scratched the surface. Uh, they're really thinking still in terms of the, the stock of utilities and roads and bridges that are old and they need to be replaced. Uh, and it'll cost this much. So while we're doing all that, while the NIB is financing that, there are explicit provisions in the bill to make sure that we build in resiliency. There's no sense in building new infrastructure if it's not <laughs> impervious to climate change and storms. There's just no purpose. Uh, so that's a big factor and will be taken into account mm -hmm. in um, assessing you know, loan requests. Um, that's an absolute must. Uh, but at the same time, we need to not take a superficial stance. You could make the case that the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the main climate bill, was a little bit superficial because all it did was sort of, all that they could afford to get through the budget was just to give some tax incentives to build some more renewable energy and for people to buy electric cars or put solar panels on their house. That's not a full plan to you know defossilize our economy. It's just not a full plan. And they did what they could afford. Um, we want to hone in on the, the core that we need to do both, but we need to sell the bill. We need to do what we need to do specifically on the infrastructure front. That's how we sell this because everybody knows they've got a dilapidated bridge. They've got a dilapidated school. They have no broadband in their area and things are crumbling. Uh, and it's not what's coming out of the budget and being passed through to states is not reaching rural areas. And there's a huge dissatisfaction. Those economies are falling apart. So altogether, we have a good thrust in our bill. Uh, I think we can make a case that our proposal for a national infrastructure bank, which is based on repurposing debt that will, um, you know, um, uh, allow us to extend credit to fix infrastructure. It's a proven model. Uh, other models that uh, have been proposed, including by American Compass, might not get us there. That's why um, uh, um, Ellen Brown presented that case study, the, that slide that she showed you on what kind of interest rates 
the, the, the two institutions could lend at, the American Compass would be the 12% and ours would be the 7%. So uh, altogether, a public bank is a better way to go and it is a proven model and we can do it again successfully. Thanks, Alpeca. We're gonna to try to get through our last two uh, comments here quickly as we're getting to the end of our allotted time. So uh, Nelson Betancourt, you've got your hand up. Do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, this, uh, this uh, conversation about investment versus expense, uh, very interesting. I wonder if we're just not running into a, a framework where part of this neoliberal economy is what's the, the issue here that has completely uh, turned our economics from uh, from a, a true econo economy, political economy, to something that is being completely altered, where uh, something that should be an investment is now being flipped into an expense. And... Uh, the reason I bring that up is because, uh, you know, it's it seems like there's something that is that is uh, that is palpable, but you don't know what it is. And I wonder if this is this framework of this neoliberal uh, viewpoint or framework is what's in the middle of, of 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 what we're struggling against. That doesn't mean that we don't continue to do the work. I mean, that goes without saying. But in terms of like. You know where 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 are things hanging up, uh, and the reason I bring that up is because <clears throat> a recent book called the The Quiet Coup: uh, Neoliberalism and the Looting of America, by by Mirza Barada Duran, uh, makes this point very clear. I mean, we have, our economy has really been taken over by law, and has completely flipped what to us seems very rational. It completely is irrational. And that's why I would say to Senator Kasagawa that what he's actually talking about is reality. He is the 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 realist, the guy in the newspaper that accused him of being something else. He is the one that is wrong because they have altered the definitions of our economy. So anyway, just okay. my comment. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Nelson. Uh, Alfeca, are we in a neoliberal economy? No, I, I look at things as a, a an assessor of budgets. Uh, I, 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 what I see in our budget is we spend a heck of a lot of money on wars uh, and you know defense and much less on building infrastructure. And we have in place things that we were guaranteed like Medicare and Social Security uh, that are not financing themselves these days. And you cannot get around the fact that we have a huge budget deficit, whatever caused it, uh, including uh, bailing out banks in the 2008 crisis, which increased a lot of our debt. Uh, these are all uh, components of our budget. Our budget is the problem. And so we need a budget workaround to fix infrastructure because we can't do it through the budget. That's the way I see it. Mm. Okay, uh, Nomi, what's your take on it? Are we in a neoliberal economy? I look at it in terms of dollars and cents, quite frankly. So I, I do look at things in terms of investment and future potential, and that includes growth in our economy, growth in our technology, growth in our infrastructure, and also viability, competitiveness, and um, effectively uh, in increasing who we are as a nation. So um, whatever we call it, um, we need to fund these particular items. Um, and the fact that we do have some smaller but we do have budget um, allocations means that you know they have viability. The, the issue is that we don't have enough from a budget perspective, and we have too much movement um, just by the nature of how our political system is. With people, you know, they come in and out, they get voted in and out, they worry about uh, constituents in the next election. The reality is these infrastructure projects takes more than a two-year term or a six-year term. So, so there has to be um, a long-term viable financing solution. This is something that's been done in the private equity community, the commercial banking community, and so forth. What we're trying to do here is create a mechanism that is purely uh, for the purposes of infrastructure, yet regulated um, actually in, in, in quite a conservative manner. And this is this is something that actually should appeal um, across the aisle because we are finding uh, the ability to leverage, again, collateral that we, we are taking out of debt and out of the system and basically just repurposing 
what has already been issued um, into these infrastructure projects, with every, which every, which will be um, absolutely investments in our in our future, as have been you know the Hoover Dam. Well, every single bridge and railroad and everything else that we've used in our country is basically either move people or commerce um, or growth in, in the country. And and the in the past uh, infrastructure banks um, have all completed their terms um, in the black. So um, also also providing profitability to the institution itself. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, labels can be so limiting, aren't they? And, um, you know, so it's, it's really interesting to sort of dig into what people mean by that. Okay, uh, Craig Schwartz, who is from Ohio and is the current chair of the Rural Caucus for the Ohio Democrats, has his hand up. Craig, do you have a additional <laughs> comment? Uh, just a quick comment. I'm also a candidate for the Ohio House. And last week, uh, I was going down to Columbus to appear personally before the Ohio Chamber of Commerce Screening Committee. There were several members of the executive committee there. And I told them point blank to their faces, I think they were a little shocked, that I wasn't there for their endorsement because I know how they operate. They go to endorse Democrats. They always go for the, the incumbents. But I was there for their endorsement for the public banking bill that we were pushing forward on the state level. And I also mentioned H.R. 4052. Mm -hmm. Going back to what those representatives were saying before about how you reach Republicans, do this. Schedule with your state chambers of commerce right away. They know nothing about public banking. These people were shocked. They gave me the floor for half an hour. Wow. And I gave them the whole history lesson. And they were pleasantly surprised. I wasn't bashing these people. I was just basically saying that we are doing not enough here in Ohio we're going in an opposite direction. It just came out publicly that Ohio's ranked 42nd out of 50 in terms of the uh, strength of economies. <laughs> and to your point, Nomi, uh, earlier, I used almost exactly your, your wordage. I told them you need an external finance vehicle when I was explaining the public banking system to them. So I said, you're not raising any new taxes and you're not having to uh, increase the size of the budget. And so on both the state and the federal level, I gave these guys um, this history example, and I stressed this to the other legislators on this call. Go to your chambers of commerce. They, these guys are lobbyists. They will have direct access to the Republican uh, constituency. That's their, their, their clientele. And these people were open to this concept, and we are going to follow up. Um, as I told them uh, before, that we are going to be pushing our Ohio bill through the LSC, Legislative Services Commission this fall, and then we're gonna be ready to go uh, in next January, the next session with the, with the bill. And um, I just wanted to you know, put that out there that uh, I've made a lot of inroads in this past week. Uh, right. And these people Thanks. get it. Thanks Craig for sharing. I, I think that's really important, Ch the Chambers of Commerce and in all of our states and communities. And I think that, uh, sort of ties in with uh, the concept that Nelson was bringing up on reindustrial or industrial policy, and more and more people, thought provokers, thought leaders in America are talking about that. So uh, that might be a good subject for a future webinar. Okay, so we're going to go to uh, Joe for a brief question or comment, and then we're going to go to Nomi to wrap things up for this evening. So Joe, do you have a quick uh, comment or question? Yeah, I just wanted to comment about the neoliberal question, and I think it's better to talk about plutocrats, the people, <laughs> as opposed to a, a label or an ideology. And uh, I would direct people to uh, look up on the internet, uh, Google um, um, President Roosevelt's speech, 1936, on economic royalty and how they stole the freedom of the people, how they oppressed the people. And of course, in 1944, he wrote about having a second bill of rights which would also address that and uh, that we you know we have to it, the the plutocrats don't want the government to spend money because it takes away from the much higher profits they make on consumerism but we need to put first things it. first so we are going to go to nomi i know you had your hand up um uh, very recently and so i'd like to see if you have a final comment and maybe some uh, uh wrap it up uh thoughts to close out our webinar this evening um yeah i, I know i know we're over time here um i i, I just think that uh, we we continue to you know sort of hone in on the practicalities of of the national infrastructure bank um 
because um, I think those are important. As Craig was saying, those, those are things that get through to local businesses, chamber of commerces, Republicans and Democrats are like, look, we have needs, we don't have enough funding, and this is a way to do it without increasing debt, the deficit, um, or future budgets or, or, or future fights, you know, it, and, and you do that piecemeal. So I think if we if we really hone in on it, and, and Alfeca has a slide on this, that the actual areas of infrastructure that we are pinpointing in terms of requiring financing is matching um, what the American Civil Engineer Society is, has laid out um, with, with a few more in there, that these are all things that Republicans and Democrats alike um, are, are are concerned about. I mean, we're sitting here right right now, and today um, there was there was an act passed on on, on nuclear technology, um, which was bipartisan. Um, I'm just involved in that, so I just I just had some notice on that. It's bipartisan because it it has it's it's a it's it's a way to provide more energy, uh, cleaner than a lot of other components, and advancing the technology um, will also advance the way in which it's 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 provided, and increasing the power grid capacity will allow that to even be more efficient and more clean. So these things all intersect, and I think. If we really hone in on that message of intersection of the financing and the needs, that is something that spreads across all communities, private businesses, both parties um, and the like. All right. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for your time and attention here this evening. We really appreciate you all being here. If we can help you reach out to the congressperson in your area, please give us uh, a shout, give us a call, send us an email, and we would be happy to work with you to raise awareness and educate the elected officials in your neck of the woods. So thanks, everyone, and have a good evening, and tune in again, again next month. Thank you.